All right, uh, my name is Bill. I'm from Diamante. Um, we'll tell you a little bit about Diamante at the tail end. Um, we have a Kubernetes platform, uh, and we'll talk you know, in detail about us. But really, what I want to talk about is um, title says database as a service, but it's really about stateful applications. Is Kubernetes ready for stateful applications? We sell a Kubernetes platform, and we talk to a lot of people who are just starting with containers. They haven't chosen a, um, an orchestration system. Some of them are starting or committed to Kubernetes. Other people are already um, preparing for production, right? So they're, they're migrating applications over, but they're not yet fully in production. Other people have been in production in Kubernetes for, uh, for a while, either on premises or in public cloud. But we often hear, even from very experienced people, that Kubernetes isn't a place for large stateful applications like databases. They always have those outside of the Kubernetes cluster. They consume either services from the public cloud, like a database service, or they consume database services that are already in their environment. And another sort of analogous uh, thing that comes up is where people say that they don't put uh, analytics platforms in. And even the, the vendors of analytics platforms often don't, they're not moving quickly towards Kubernetes or containerized services. So, I want to sort of dispel some of that and you know show you how it can be done or and really the reason why um, you know why these think you know this thought process uh, exist databases and uh, specifically have a lot of advantages um, for running in containers and, and a lot of people a lot of developers a lot of architects of applications don't don't think of this first, right? They, they fall into the thinking, it already sits outside, we've got DBAs and we've got enterprise systems that we can um, address or it's a public cloud and we can use an external service. Um, containers versus sort of the monolithic uh, legacy way of running applications, you know, it's all the advantages of, of containers. So they're lightweight, they use less disk space, they can be revved quickly. Um, you know, I can get the latest or the specific version I want and run it quickly because it's a very, it's an excellent packaging mechanism for delivering software to a host. Security is enhanced. Um, you know, security in containers is not perfect, but it's enhanced in the sense that the container runs only the software that you want and the host, whether it's public cloud or private, you're not inheriting a Linux box with two years worth of updates and maybe some software that somebody else ran. Um, you're not hand patching things. It's minimal code, both at the uh, node level and at the container level. I'm gonna bring up a slide that shows about some of the flexibilities that containers bring to databases. D um, databases are not often run as a single monolithic database, but pairs of databases sort of uh, in a replication scheme. There's uh, other applications that are dependent on them. There's backup software. All of these things can be containerized and you can take advantage of the same um, sort of infrastructure as code or application architecture as code that works with other microservices. So these complex relationships aren't hand drawn on a whiteboard and then implemented with system D and with scripts and custom configuration files that are specific to your organization. They're in YAML that's transferable between Kubernetes platforms and transferable you know, to whole other um, departments or other applications. And that's the portability side. And then of course scale. Now if, when I have all this as code, I can deploy databases quickly and as many times I need for maybe test dev instances. So a lot of small things on the screen. You'll probably want to take advantage of those screens. Um, this is a database as a service example using Crunchy Data's version of Postgres. Um, if you're not familiar with it, Postgres is a it's actually, I think about a 20-year-old database, but it's a great, very strong, powerful relational database that can do basically all the features of the basic Oracle uh, set. So it's an ACID-compliant relational database. And there's two large, uh, larger companies uh, that provide uh, sort of third-party support for Postgres. So they have their own um, like. Um, maintenance that they can provide. So if you need somebody to pay maintenance for this open source database, so you can get bug fixes, et cetera, Crunchy Data is one, Enterprise DB is another. Uh, we work with both of them uh, with our customers. And these, these companies have already moved to containers. They're containerizing Postgres database and they're adding other features around it. And so what we see here, um, I'm gonna try to point with um, the pointer here, 
but over, and these, these two bubbles on the left represent pods. The one on the right is the primary pod, that's your, say, your master database. And then there's a replica pod. And the largest bubble inside those, excuse me, um, represents just, it's basically just a Postgres um, uh, container image, right? It's a very small type, only does Postgres. But you might want to SSH into the, to the uh, database once in a while. So they have a sidecar for SSH daemon. Um, they have a data collector. That's CrunchyDB's data collector, but that's something that you would end up doing anyway so that you can put data into Prometheus and graph it out with Grafana and you'll, you can see and follow the lines and it exports that way. So there's a lot more I could go on. There's backup, um, there's replication between these. Um, and then up here at the top, you see they use Kubernetes services to represent these. And then there's a pool that sits in front of it. So all read and write requests to the database come in through this PG pool, which is an independent, small, open source piece of software that Crunchy Data maintains. And writes go to the primary database. Reads can be striped across all of the available um, replica databases for performance. And these are just building blocks. This is, looks pretty complex, but there's only a handful of pieces and you know, it's all YAML that you can template out and, and deploy and you can basically go splat, throw all this onto a Kubernetes system and within a couple minutes at most, but often several tens of seconds, you've got this highly complex, highly available system running. So to me, this is a lot easier than the days of not too long ago, even today, where you get a VM, cloud or private, doesn't matter, and then your Linux sysadmin gets it into a certain state. Then somebody who's responsible for installing database software gets it into another state. You get this enterprise life cycle of open a ticket and keep passing the buck to another human. Maybe somebody scripts it all out, but then a new version of the database comes out, breaks the script. Um, you know, and you're always maintaining your Linux patches, et cetera, in that VM. This eliminates it. Your, your VM or your bare metal um, platform is patched independently, and the containers are these relatively pure little things that just get updated from the vendor. So it's a great way to deploy databases, and now you're not dependent on an external service. So whether this, you know, if you're consuming public cloud and you're using some service from Azure or from AWS, that's great, but if you want to use a specific version of a database for your software, you can bring that into uh, Kubernetes today. This is just from the application deployment perspective though. There's other things, reasons why you may not want to deploy, and these are the arguments that people use against databases um, running in Kubernetes. Part of this goes back to ephemeral or stateless applications. These are the things that we move to the public cloud and to private cloud first. They consume CPU, they consume RAM, some amount of network, usually uh, oftentimes fairly small on an individual basis. Um, and those are easy concepts to port, right? If I understand how much they run on an internal system, I can say, okay, this is my approximate need for this, you know, it uses this much RAM and this many cores, and I can pick that up and move it between clouds, and it's really pretty easy. Once you start getting storage involved for persistent data, things become complex. I did a lot of years in the storage industry. Um, luckily, I worked for some very, you know, with the, and some really good companies, but storage is, you know, what RAID levels and are we replicating and what are the commands to, to do it? And I got to go to a storage administrator to figure out the problems. It slows you down. As a developer or as an architect, those are problems. They're not solutions. It's every single storage vendor is a little bit different. Um, in Kubernetes, you know, or in a Docker container world, you have some local storage, but then there's this list of other choices. And so with, if you want persistent data, you can use external file servers, iSCSI, NFS, um, Ceph, um, ClusterFS, there's a large list of various uh, options. They all have different characteristics. So in the public cloud, GCE, there's GCE persistent disk, right? Uh, AWS has their own, but there's just one choice. But if you're gonna do this yourself, whether it's on-premises or at a colo, 
There's all these different things. They all have different capabilities. And by the way, GlusterFS and Ceph aren't easy, right? Those are like projects that people do in college and then they're hired to do that for somebody else for their scale out system. You have administrators who's just, their job is just to keep the software defined storage going. Um, so again, this doesn't make it easy for you. If you just need storage and you need it to be fast because it needs to be as good as the stuff that you were using before in a service, but now you need to know the individual characteristics. It's not easy. So these are the things that have kept databases um, from being widely deployed, big performant databases from being widely deployed um, in Kubernetes. And by the way, at the end, if there's anybody who says, no, we've been doing it for years, I'd love to talk to you because um, I, will, I like to hear both sides of all the stories, right? So um, the biggest bottleneck is storage for databases, right? I need CPU, hey, Kubernetes, I can say how many cores I want. I need RAM, I can tell how much RAM I want. But Kubernetes has no built-in facility for classifying the performance of storage. What you can do is you can say, I look for a label. I want this on this label of storage, and those labels are different tiers sold to you by your public cloud provider. Or maybe they're labeled internally for your internal storage on your um, network. Um, but then there's also other storage options. Remember, if you're going to move a database from, it's running on Oracle, it's in Oracle Exadata, or it's on some big uh, piece of equipment from Dell EMC, it's got a certain performance characteristics. There's people who maintain it, and now you're saying I can do it in software, or I can do it on my software and bring it in. You need to be able to step up and pr uh, provide all those. And th that includes backups, snapshots, all these capabilities that are in these systems that have been around for years. Um, in a databases, there's this term ACID, and the D in ACID is durability. Uh, data that you put into the database needs to be durable, and that can be done in software but it's no good if the hardware underneath is not properly protected. So, and then predictable performance. And all of these things are sort of the bugaboos of why we'll move the database to the cluster last, right? We've got all these, these things that are, need to be solved, but we can solve the ephemeral stuff really easily. So, a few years ago, something came to Kubernetes that was helping to solve some of these problems. Um, Flex volume is one of the choices for persistent volumes. And if you go to the Kubernetes.io documentation, it's just listed there as one of many. Um, that was developed and contributed to Kubernetes uh, by Diamante, actually. We were known as DataWise Systems in the early days of our company. And we needed a way to plug in our storage that's in our on-premises Kubernetes solution into Kubernetes without doing it in a proprietary fashion, without forking and modifying Kubernetes. Um, and if we did it in a proprietary fashion, it could break. Kubernetes could change something and then all of a sudden our plugin doesn't work and we'd always be chasing the very rapid development of Kubernetes. So we proposed a standard way to plug in third-party storage and basically said, get out of the business of adding to this large list of, of uh, persistent volumes and come up with a plug-in system and we'll plug ours in and everybody in the world can plug theirs in. So we did that. And so what that has done is given developers and architects access to lots of different storage. Okay, so if you're doing something on-premises, by the way, I almost don't want to ask this question, but is everybody here in public cloud? Do some of you work on on-premises solutions? Anybody? All right. I'll just look at you the rest of the time now. Um, so, and, it, and it's still, every public cloud has their type of you know, plug-in for something, but there's, um, this has opened this up. So now lots of vendors, like former place, a place I used to work at, they can plug theirs in. Their competitors can, can plug in. And, and we can all bring all of the capabilities of 20 to 30 years of enterprise storage to the world of public and private cloud. Um, we contributed and continue to contribute to Flex Volume. It's being supplanted by something called CSI, the Container Storage Interface. We were on that initial working group. We continue to contribute. So that's one of the things that we do is we make Kubernetes better um, for everybody so that we can get our product in and do better things with our product. 
Um, and the great thing about Flex Volume is, unlike just using uh, some plugins don't have this capability, um, Flex Volume allows you to access a lot of the capabilities of that specific array directly from the pod spec. So if that, um, that storage has quality of service, you can access it as a developer. If it has certain performance tiers, you can do it. If you, you, know, you can get the right amount of storage on demand. So there's a lot of things that normally, in the old days, you would have had to go to a storage guy, beg, borrow, and steal to get a certain amount of storage of a certain performance class and get it and use it. And by the way, the next thing you deploy, you need that to do that as well. Right? So this makes it potentially um, you know, capable for you guys to do immediate deployments of high quality, high performance storage into a Kubernetes cluster. You know, if you are putting this all together yourself and not just consuming a Kubernetes service from the public cloud, you're gonna have to go through a lot of these, these pieces. Storage just complicates it even more, right? Um, network storage is one bubble on there, but it's a big stopping point. So what we've done, and this is our little you know, two minute ad for us, is that we've really operationalized this. We provide a Kubernetes, essentially it's an appliance, but it's a pre-configured hardware and software Kubernetes platform. And so we eliminate all this by having a system that basically is, you know, you start with a non-running uh, system and you run one command, and now I have uh, a private cloud. And, and while you can go to the public cloud and get a public cloud with a credit card and bring it up pretty easily, um, for on-premises, we're the easy button. So it's literally install, rack and stack, and get IP addresses on the nodes. Let's say you have a 30 node system you're installing. That's gonna take a while. I gotta log into 30 systems and, and configure them. Um, but then, the first command line on there is DCTL, so kubectl, we have a Diamante CTL or DCTL cluster create, and there's a few command line arguments. Now Kubernetes is up and running. Persistent storage and uh, networks can be defined. Um, it's, it's the easiest Kubernetes deployment you've uh, ever seen, um, and, and you're up and running. So if you do have a request for on-premises, or if you're doing large databases, high-performance databases that can get very expensive in the public cloud, we're a great solution for on-premises. Um, we're, we're really uh, sort of unique in the sense that we're selling a hardware platform. It's bare metal Kubernetes. It is mainline Kubernetes. We only extend it, as I said, through the plugin systems, the network and storage plugin systems that they provide. Um, so therefore, we're able to earn the um, certified Kubernetes uh, sticker that you know it, you should be able to take something that you run on Google or that you run on um, Azure or AWS, bring it to us, change the pointers from GCE persistent disk to Diamante uh, style, and it'll run. It'll run great. It'll run faster. Um, and then if you decide that no, I need to go switch to yet another provider, on premises or public cloud, it's still portable. Again, we're just an open Kubernetes platform. We do some great things around the storage and networking as well with quality of service. So we can enforce quality of service so you can have different applications running in the same cluster, running on the same storage and network and guarantee that the low, the, uh, low importance uh, pods are not gonna overrun my storage or network from the more important ones. So you can boost, say, the, uh, the quality of service for an important central database, but you could have a CI CD pipeline in the background that you wanna run quick, but you don't ever want it to impact performance testing or anything else. So, um, and this is no hypervisor, right? And we support the whole stack. So we're trying to make it on-premises as easy uh, um, to use and to support as public cloud. So you don't have to be a Kubernetes administrator. You may have one, but you don't need to administer Kubernetes. You need to deploy to Kubernetes, right? You concentrate on doing the value to your business, which is getting those apps up and running and keeping them running not having an expert in the plumbing of the network storage and Kubernetes underneath. So that's like consuming public cloud, right? And that's really it. So thank you so much. <laughs>